who was going to be the first to take that trip to Goon City. Now available on ProWrestlingTees.com, the newest design for Off The Script, taking that trip to Goon City. ProWrestlingTees.com slash Off The Script, 1999. Get yours today on top of version 1 and version 2 of Get Off My TV. Goon City is the newest edition for the Off The Script podcast, hosted by yours truly, JD from NY. Let's all take that bus trip to Goon City collectively, man. Let's populate Goon City and show why this is the number one fucking podcast on YouTube.com, man. That's ProWrestlingTees.com slash Off The Script. I just recorded fucking five minutes of this fucking podcast without a microphone functioning. Now I'm fucking pissed. Now I'm fucking pissed because I did five minutes of flawless fucking commentary and the microphone wasn't even fucking working. Go fuck yourself, Audio Technica, you fucking piece of shit. Alright? Anyway. Anyway, let me adjust myself so you guys can see the fucking Yankee sucks clearly. There you go. But who the fuck am I, man? I'm a Braves fan. Who am I to say that the Yankees suck? But all I know, all I know about today is off the script. Because I'm this is number 113, part number 3. Of the number one fucking source right here on YouTube.com for everything WWE. This is off the script. Thank you guys so much for joining me on Sunday. I feel like a fucking idiot now that I see my recording time up to seven minutes. Five minutes of it was me talking to nobody. Jesus Christ, man. Hopefully you guys can hear me now. Whatever the case may be, this is off the script. Got a lot of news to go into. I am not going to waste any of your time. You guys know the drill. Twitter, at JD from NY206. Subscribe to the channel if you have not done so already. This is the best place for WWE news and rumors. Get your fucking t-shirts. I can't stress this enough, man. ProWrestlingTees.com slash off the script. New t-shirt designs are in the works. What's coming up, man? Get off my TV. Ramen Reigns, uh, just throwing a few ideas out there at you guys. It's coming, they're coming, don't worry about it. Gonna fill up that shop with the best looking fucking t-shirts money can buy, bro. That's what I'm about, I wanna give you guys quality. ProWrestlingTees.com slash off the script. WrestleCrate.com and on Twitter at WrestleCrates, use the coupon code JD sent me for an instant 10% off your first purchase. What is WrestleCrate? Visit the website. Number one subscription service delivered to your front door with wrestling shit, man. The absolute best you can buy for your money. And finally, I was on two, actually one podcast, but I'm going to mention two podcasts. Number one, my own, obviously. Off the Script, iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher Radio, and Audio Boom. Go and check that out. Talk about everything during the week that we usually don't talk about here. I go over Monday Night Raw, I review NXT, we talk about news and rumors, etc., etc. It's a great listen for an hour and a half. iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher Radio, and Audio Boom. And I was also on the Chair Shot Reality Podcast with Blake and Shane talking about JD's fucking goon of the month. Who is it? I don't know, man. You gotta listen. They're on iTunes and Audio Boom as well. Links are down below in the description. Now, I want to thank Dank Ops, and I want to thank him for including me in the 2K16 tournament, YouTuber tournament for, for WW2K16. I made a video, it finally went up uh, after everybody else because I had uh, literally no time to get anything up during the week because of work. It is up, it was uploaded yesterday. Everybody that's listening to this podcast, I, I want you guys to do me a favor, okay? I want you guys to go and like the video, get it to the most thumbs up that you can possibly get it to. Tweet it to 2K Games. I'm going to leave their Twitter down below as well with the description. 
uh, in the description with the link to the video. Make sure you guys tweet them out. They just followed me for whatever reason, man. I love WWE. Everybody knows this. I, I love streaming Universe Mode for you guys. It's very entertaining. It's very interactive. And I made this video, and I'm glad that Thank Ops included me, and hopefully will continue to include me in future tournaments. But I did love the video. I love the way it came out. So if you guys missed that, link is down below. Hit that thumbs up and show some support for that video. I would greatly appreciate it. I say this because Off The Script is my most viewed content throughout the week, okay? And also, for my Black Ops 3 stuff, I love Call of Duty. I love making Call of Duty content. It's funny. It's hilarious. It's real. I did finally... We are in Life After Prestige Master. This was the number one series when it came to Call of Duty, especially Black Ops 2. Now we're returning it with Black Ops 3. I made the first episode last night. If you guys missed it, go check it out. Link will also be down in the description below. If everybody can go like the video and support the video, man, that's watching this right now, I would greatly appreciate it. I love it. It's just me talking on the couch, drinking some weird, obscure beer that nobody's ever fucking heard of before. We're talking shit. You guys get to see great gameplay on top of that. It's just a fun time, man. So please go and support those two videos. I would greatly appreciate. Thank you guys very, very much, all right? Now, let's get into the news, man. Everybody and their fucking mother was tweeting me last night about Adam Rose. Adam Rose and Connor of the Ascension suspended... For wellness policy violations. WWE has tried for years to make sure talent is safe within the company. While they have not been perfect with this over the years, they have improved each year as time has passed. After the passing of Eddie Guerrero, WWE instituted a substance abuse wellness policy. It was geared towards making sure talent stayed away from harmful drugs. WWE had a list of banned drugs such as steroids and painkillers that talent could not take if a talent did not have a prescription they would be suspended for a period of time if they failed a surprise drug test wwe gave talent a three strike rule three strikes and you're out if you failed once you were suspended for 30 days a second violation would mean a 60 day suspension Finally, a third offense would result in immediate termination from WWE and the talent could not be rehired for the period of one year. WWE also offers free rehab to the current and past WWE talent who ask for help. WWE has turned down some like Sonny over time due to the fact that they have spent a lot of money on her, on her rehabilitation, but she continues to relapse. The company does take wellness policy very seriously and thus... They suspend talent when needed. While fans have not been um, very, very keen on seeing a violation for some time now, it does appear that two infractions have now recently occurred. According to WWE, both Adam Rose and Ascension member Connor failed their drug test for a second time, which resulted in 60-day suspensions for each man starting immediately. This is a bummer to both men, clearly, However, Rose possibly suffers the most between the two. WWE has finally allowed Rose to do more for the company as his role within the social outcast group has relatively good has been relatively good for his career. I don't know about that, but whatever the case may be, it's not good for Adam Rose. His career is on the fucking downslide, you know, for the most part, but this is obviously not going to do him any good. Both men are not major stars for WWE, but even if they were, WWE had no choice but to suspend them due to the rules of the wellness policy. After the death of Chris Benoit, these drug tests became a much bigger deal. Initially, it seemed like the company didn't care much and only had the policy to look good in the public eye. After Benoit, it became a much bigger thing for the company to focus on. They didn't want to have another situation like that as WWE has still not fully recovered from the acts of Benoit when he committed, um, you know, the heinous acts where he murdered his family, even though they had not, uh, they had nothing to do with him harming himself or anyone else. People point to the numerous headshots over the years, but Benoit also had drugs in his system after he took his own life. WWE did decide to remove chair shots to the head regardless and are focused on making sure head... Uh, making sure the head of every talent is protected. 
They even make sure no one wrestles with a concussion now and have improved their head exams for talent ever since CM Punk exposed their terrible tests when he was hurt in 2014. WWE is very particular about the drugs one puts in their body. While prescription, prescription drugs are considered okay, WWE does not like for talent to be on certain ones. The drug usage had to be passed through WWE's office from a doctor with why a talent needs such a medication. Meanwhile, even many over-the-counter drugs are not good. Decongestants like, I, I can't pronounce this, pardon me if I'm pronouncing this wrong, pseudo, pseudofedrine, which has name brands like Sudafed, happens to be illegal according to the policy, even though it is OTC, over-the-counter. A doctor still has to clear it for WWE. You can see a list of WWE's banned drugs online if you guys want to go check that out. WWE takes the Wallace policy very seriously, and talent have seemingly been good about not violating it. You do see violations happen from time to time, although. However, WWE does what it can to protect the talent. There is no word on whether Adam Rose or Connor took the result, uh, took that results in their failed drug test will probably end up finding out down the line what eventually led to their you know suspension from now uh for now all that it seems to be known is that both men are gone for at least two months this is obviously not good you know the best thing that we can say here is that these guys haven't been in the limelight or in the spotlight for uh, for a time being. They haven't been in the spotlight at all, really. Adam Rose and Connor, not really in the upper echelon of talent in WWE. This is the second violation, which is new, which is new to me. I, I didn't know about Connor being a second violation here. I, I didn't know of Adam Rose being of a violation, period. But according to the reports, this is the second violation for both men. Obviously, this is not good for their careers. One more, and they're gone, okay? Adam Rose, I, I, I mean, I really don't know what to think about this, honestly. I, I really don't know what to think about this. I'm really stumped here, and this is the first time ever. I mean, both guys really are irrelevant on, on WWE television. WWE does not care for both. I'm surprised WWE hasn't released Adam Rose or The Ascension, period, just the way they've been booked. Obviously, Adam Rose and Connor here, they don't want to get fired. Obviously, they don't want to lose their jobs. I have no idea what they've been suspended for. Who knows what it could be? It might be a couple of days till we find out exactly what they were suspended for or what types of drugs they were suspended for. But WWE is serious about this. And, you know... I have to blame both of these guys. They should know the policies through and through. They should know the rules and regulations of being a WWE superstar. I feel bad for Adam Rose especially. You know, Adam Rose is a talented guy. And ever since that E60 special where he was documented with his wife and his son, WWE failed to capitalize on making Adam Rose a household name. I mean, you put this guy and you spotlight him on ESPN and you make such a heartfelt story and documentary surrounding him and his life and you don't build upon that. I remember watching that and I cried. I legit actually shed tears because of the fucking sadness I was watching on my television from Adam Rose about his kid and his kid's uh, illness and, you know, w whatever was going on with his family. It was very sad. And the fact that WWE didn't capitalize on that just was very shocking to me. They could have did anything with this guy coming out of that E60 special, and he would have been, he, he would have blew up. They failed to capitalize on it. WWE didn't want to do it because they have no interest in pushing Adam Rose. Adam Rose to them is probably not a moneymaker. Neither is the Ascension. WWE fucked the Ascension up. As soon as they made their main roster debut, WWE, all they needed to do with the Ascension to get them over was when the Usos won the Tag Team Championships at the end of 2014. I believe, someone correct me if I'm wrong, 
but I'm pretty positive that the Usos won the Tag Team Championships on the last Monday Night Raw of 2014. I don't know who they beat, I don't give a shit, but they won the Tag Team titles. The Ascension was built up as the best tag team that NXT had to offer. They were fucking great. They demanded your attention with their entrance and the music and the fucking just presence that they gave you in a WWE arena with the entrance and the lighting. Everything about them demanded your attention. They were built up as the longest reigning NXT champions, NXT tag team champions of all time. And how WWE didn't capitalize on that, I don't know. I mean, I don't know who in creative thought that mocking them as a ripoff, Legion of Doom, Demolition, I don't know whose idea that was, but clearly that guy has no grasp on what good tag teams are in WWE. That is a goon who doesn't know anything about the WWE product. So they booked them in a situation where they were making fun of old tag teams, they were saying that they were better than the old tag teams, they were better than the Legion of Doom, they were better than Demolition, and then sooner or later, they ended up feuding with the New Age Outlaws, right? But before that, you had all these historic tag teams come out and just demolish them, embarrass them on Monday Night Raw. I believe it was the old school Raw that WWE did. All these old school teams came out, and laid waste to the Ascension. From there, they were fucking absolutely meaningless. Why would you do that with two guys that NXT and Triple H put so much fucking heart and passion into to build up, and when they make the main roster, nobody gives a shit about them? WWE doesn't give a shit about these guys. WWE doesn't give a shit about these guys. You know, my mentality is... You, you take a look at Adam Rose and Connor and, and both of their statuses within WWE. You know, I'm pretty sure they don't want to lose their job, but they're more loose to not giving a shit about what they do because they're not happy in the current roles that they're in. I know for a fact, I would, I would bank on it, that these guys are not happy in the roles that they are in. Yeah, they're working for WWE. Yeah, they're in the WWE. They're in the number one company in North America. But, I mean, these guys are in the profession that they're in, that, that, you know, that they're in, because they want to succeed. They want to wrestle. They want to perform. They want to excel. They're not doing that. WWE is not allowing them to do that. And in the Ascensions... You know, in the Ascensions world, and on their behalf, they were doing it in NXT, and now they've been wasting away for two years. This is two years of their fucking career. They can't get back. Adam Rose was given a fucking party gimmick that was great in NXT, and they moved him up to the main roster. For what? For what? If they knew he would fail, why did they give him this spot on the main roster? And now look at him. It's, it's like they're fucking embarrassing him. He's a social outcast. He's an outcast in WWE. He's never going to have a role that he wants. He's never going to have a role that he's happy with. And fuck that. Fuck those people that say, listen, Adam Rose should be happy. He's fortunate. He's got a role on TV. Fuck that, dude. This guy's a fucking... He's playing a member of the social outcasts. He's irrelevant. You know that, I know that, he's going nowhere with that gimmick, he's going nowhere with that group. WWE had several opportunities to make this guy right. With, with the fucking E60 special and Ray LaPon coming out of that, they could have put him in the Wyatt family. They could still put him in the Wyatt family as Leo Kruger. Have him grow the beard out, have him be that rough, tough, you know, that rough tough, rugged individual that he was down in FCW, in NXT. Well, I don't understand where their mindset is. So, Adam Rose and Connor suspended. I would like to think that they do care about their jobs, but I would not bet against these guys being a little bit more lenient and loose and carefree about what they do because they're not happy in WWE. They're not. In their roles, how can anybody be happy about what they're doing? They're glorified fucking jobbers. Yeah, like I said, you're in the WWE, but you're an embarrassment to everybody, man. 
When you post pictures on Instagram, nobody gives a shit about the Ascension. When you highlight the Ascension on Monday Night Raw, nobody's going to the arena to see great tag team wrestling because of the Ascension. Nobody's going to the arena to see Adam Rose. Nobody's hashtagging social outcasts. Fuck out of here, man. These guys are unhappy with what they're doing. And if, I, and like I said, if I was to be a betting man, I would bet that these guys want their out of WWE. That's just my honest opinion on that. Adam Rose and Connor suspended for the wellness policy. Second time, second violation for both men. What's going to happen here? I don't know, but they're both out 60 days. What does this mean for the Ascension? You got Connor out. Victor, what the fuck's Victor going to do? Connor's out for 60 days by default. Victor's out 60 days. Sucks to be the Ascension. Adam Rose, what are they going to say about Adam Rose as far as the social outcast when they come on TV? Is he injured? Are they going to make up a storyline that he got hurt for two months? Whatever the case may be, they are off TV for 60 days. Randy Orton will miss two more months of WWE action. WWE superstar Randy Orton has been out of action since last year due to a bad, so due to a bad shoulder injury. Orton, of course, already has a hypermobile shoulder, which means a shoulder issue for the Viper is not always terrible as he will always have them. However, it may take him longer to heal up from a severe injury to that area. Ever since his last injury, Orton has done his best to make sure he doesn't commit the same mistakes he did before. He now has his own bus where he rides to each event. He also ices his shoulders and hurt areas after each show as well. This seemed to help the former WWE World Heavyweight Champion. However, in 2015 was a year of injuries for WWE Superstars. In 2016 has started off badly for talent as well. Due to seemingly sheer force of nature, people were hurt and Orton happened to be a part of the list. The rumor is that Orton hurt his shoulder taking out trash at home, but most believe he was hurt in a match and things worsened at home for him. Regardless of how he hurt his shoulder, the thought was that we would see Randy Orton make his return to WWE later this month or early next month. He's been out since October and this would mark eight months without seeing him compete within a WWE ring. According to Ringside News, however, Orton will miss another two months. That means we may not see the Viper until possibly July. Due to Orton's shoulder condition that already exists, there's a chance it is causing his recovery to take longer. However, it was a weird issue for WWE when it came to shoulder issues. Cesaro, John Cena, Sami Zayn, and Hideo Itami all had shoulder injuries that took place last year or early this year. Orton was a part of this list. John Cena ended up having a lot more issues than just a normal shoulder injury, but he is expected back around June. Itami was hurt last summer, but had complications which caused his recovery to take longer. Cesaro and Zayn have already returned from their injuries, which leaves Orton as the remaining main roster guy, along with Cena, who was hurt last year and has yet to return to action. This could be WWE being cautious with Randy Orton. Most believe he is fine, and many saw him during WrestleMania week where he looked okay. However, WWE had so many guys go down with shoulder injuries that hurrying someone back that does not need to be hurried back would be a bad idea. Absolutely the most important statement in this report. Orton has also stated that he would like a shorter schedule where he works full-time for a number of months and takes an off-season of sorts for himself and gets rest in which he needs. Something like eight months on, four months off could do wonders for someone like Orton, who has been with the WWE for well over a decade. He is still a valuable part of WWE, and having him overworked would be bad. With someone who has a history of shoulder issues, having Randy Orton work a shorter schedule could only extend his career with WWE. He could very well be around for another decade with something like that for himself. As for a return, nothing is planned, storyline-wise, uh, as, as well for him, Randy Orton. Nothing is planned, storyline-wise. Seems obvious Randy Orton will be a part of SummerSlam, which I'm assuming he will. So WWE may hold off until the night after WWE Battleground if they want to make sure that he is fine 100%. We'll have to wait and see what they decide. For now, we do know he won't be back as soon as originally hoped. There's no reason... For WWE to rush Randy Orton back. There's absolutely none. I, I doubt, you know, guys like me and you and the people that watch this podcast that were dying to see Randy Orton back. All I know, 
And the main gripe that I have with Randy Orton is that he gets stale too fast. They turned him face from a heel. Everything was great. And then it just started to fucking go downhill ever since. And then he got hurt. Randy Orton, in my honest opinion, was the best as the legend killer. I think Randy Orton needs to come back as a heel. I think Randy Orton needs to come back as a heel. He needs to be the legend killer again. I would like for him to revisit that. But overall, regarding Orton, there's no reason for him to rush back. WWE has more than enough talent right now with the influx of NXT guys. That was proven about Monday Night Raw on Monday. They're more than capable of giving us a good fucking show on Monday night. They don't need to rush back Cena. They don't need to rush back Orton. They don't need to rush back Rollins, okay? Those guys, let them rest. Let them come back when they are scheduled to come back. There's no reason to rush them. As for an offseason, I think all, all guys on the roster, everyone on the roster should have at least an off-season. One month, two months to just rest and recuperate. Not only will that extend their careers, but it will cut down on the injuries. It will give these guys more time to heal when they are not hurt, when they're feeling okay. They get to rest and relax and recuperate and regenerate. You know, Orton, eight months on, four months off would be fucking great. Same thing with Cena. Especially as you get older, man. Orton, someone who's in his 30s, mid-30s, Orton is still relatively young, but he's been in the business quite a long time. John Cena can certainly use the time off as well. We don't need to see John Cena 12 months out of the year. We don't need to see Orton 12 months out of the year. That gives the roster breathing room, and it also gives a spot to the guys who are younger to grab a main event spot, to move up, to show WWE what they got with an Orton out, with the Cena out. Grab that, br that brass ring, grab that spot, grab the ball, and run with it. Gives opportunities to everybody. So not only is it good for the guys who are recovering and recuperating and getting, you know, well from injury or whatever. The, you know, the, obviously being on the road, you're beaten and battered. Rest up. It also gives uh, an ample amount of time for the young guys to just go out there, you know, fresh and healthy and just show WWE what they got. And when those guys are out, you can slide these young guys right into the main event spot. And when everybody's back at the same time, you got a full roster of main event guys and people and, and, and just people that the audience wants to see. So I, I think it's great. There's no reason to rush back Orton. He'll be back in July around Money in the Bank. You know, obviously he's going to be at SummerSlam. He's going to have something very important to do at SummerSlam. It's going to be great to see him when he comes back, but there's no reason to rush anybody back from injury. Cena, Orton, and Rollins. WWE Superstar is complaining that AJ Styles is working too stiff in the ring. Cry me a fucking river, the Styles Clash. Will it be officially banned? Throughout the course of his career, AJ Styles has proven he's one of the greatest wrestling talents in the entire world. During that time, he's also had a number of complaints from multiple talents throughout different promotions that have issues with his in-ring style and say that he works too stiff. That has led many calling for Styles Clash to be banned due to it being dangerous and causing injuries. Now that talk is starting up in WWE as well. Anyone that has watched Styles during his first two and a half months in WWE has noticed that he uses the Styles Clash finishing move very sparingly. He'll use the calf crusher, submission, hold, or the flying forearm to finish off his opponents. One could be led to believe that the Styles Clash has been banned by WWE, but he's been told to only use it on special occasions. In early March, it was rumored that the move had been banned entirely, but he has used it since. It's been said before that his finishing maneuver isn't the only issue, as other wrestlers believe that Styles works too stiff in the ring. After his match against Sami Zayn this week on Monday Night Raw, the talk about his work has come up again. Jim Ross actually has touched upon those rumors and is letting the world know that some things should be better left out of public discussions. He has been asked about Zayn on the WWE main roster and Styles working too stiff with his opponents. Zayn is a main eventer. He's a main eventer in waiting, and he's likely not going to be waiting too long. Talented, dedicated, professional is Sami Zayn. By the way, working stiff isn't a crime, but working in a careless manner is. Don't believe all that you read or hear. Rumors always fly around, and there have been no reports straight from any WWE talent that Styles is working too stiff in the ring. It does truly seem that AJ Styles is using the Styles Clash a lot less 
than he used to in previous promotions. In 2014, Styles was in a match with Yoshitatsu in Japan, in New Japan Pro Wrestling, and the finish of the match was quite frightening. Styles set up Tatsu for the Styles Clash, delivered it, and it was botched to the point where Tatsu landed on the back and top of his head. Yoshitatsu ended up having his neck broken and was out of action for 18 months, only recently returning to the ring. There was another incident in 2014 where a British wrestler named Lionheart also had his neck broken in a match with Styles. The injury happened due to a botched Styles clash, and Lionheart has often spoken publicly about having the move banned throughout all of professional wrestling. Now Styles is in WWE, and he's in a promotion where he could fight a larger selection of wrestlers and anything could happen. Danger exists in every single move of professional wrestling and something can go wrong at any time. The flying forearm is a move that AJ Styles has used for a number of years, so it's not like it's something new to him. The same can be said for the calf crusher, but these moves are not his signature move or finisher move of choice. AJ Styles is one of the most talented wrestlers in the entire world. He's won championships in about every promotion he's been in. He's challenging for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship now at payback against Roman Reigns, and many believe he's working too stiff in the ring. Professional wrestling is a dangerous sport, and anything is possible at any time, but Styles obviously knows his craft well enough to get where he is. I believe the Yoshi Tatsu thing was a botch on Tatsu. Uh, you know, when I first seen it and when I first read the reports about it, everybody was blaming Yoshi Tatsu for not tucking his head, Okay. Just look at the way Chris Jericho takes the Styles Clash. That's the way it's supposed to be delivered. If, if it's delivered in the proper manner, if it's delivered correctly, there's nothing wrong with the Styles Clash, okay? Obviously, in my honest opinion, where that move has been botched in the two instances that were referenced in this report, more than likely, it was on the recipient, okay? AJ Styles has been doing this move for how long? And those are two instances, okay? Those are two mistakes in which things happened. Like the report says, it's professional wrestling. It's a dangerous sport. Anything can fucking happen, okay? Stone Cold Steve Austin didn't, you know, expect to go fucking get a stinger in a match with Owen Hart, you know? Everybody else that's been injured in the fucking ring didn't go out there expecting to fucking blow a quad or fucking uh, have a concussion and tear a ligament or pull a hamstring, whatever the fucking case may be. You know, break a leg. Neville, on a fucking baseball slide, breaks his fucking ankle and his shin. Nobody knows that this shit's going to happen. Anything can happen in the ring. And in those two instances, it's definitely a matter of anything can happen. And it was a freak accident. Tyson Kidd. Samoa Joe didn't go out there looking to fucking injure uh, Tyson Kidd on a, on a muscle buster. I don't see people banning the fucking muscle buster. It was a fucking mistake. You know, it was a mistake. Samoa Joe has been doing that move how long? And it was a fucking accident. Tyson Kidd probably realized he didn't do something that needed to be done precisely. And he fucked up. He fucked up. I didn't see what happened to Tyson Kidd. I didn't see how Samoa Joe delivered the maneuver. But it was a freak accident. I don't see people banning the fucking muscle buster because Tyson Kidd probably now has to retire because of it. WWE banned the pile driver. They didn't ban the tombstone. It's still a fucking pile driver. You know, WWE is not going to ban the stylish clash because of two instances. And everybody's saying that he's working too stiff in the ring. This is not a pussy fucking sport, okay? This is professional wrestling. If he's working too stiff in the ring, he wants to make sure that you look good and that the match is fucking believable. He's a veteran. He's 37, 38 years old, veteran. He's won world titles all over the fucking world. I'm pretty sure AJ Styles knows what he has to do. He's working with The Miz. He's working with this one and that one. And, you know, I, I, I doubt Chris Jericho says that he's working too stiff. Why, he popped a few teeth on The Miz. He popped a few veneers on The Miz. Oh, give me a fucking break. Who's The Miz? You know, The Miz is probably the one who went to him and went to WWE and said, oh, he's working too stiff, he knocked my teeth out. I doubt, I doubt AJ Styles and Chris Jericho had any problems. I doubt Chris Jericho went to WWE and said, listen, this guy's working too fucking stiff. I doubt Sami Zayn went to WWE saying, this guy's working too stiff. Why would Sami Zayn go and complain about something when he's on the main roster for less than two months? 
You know, he's not in any position to fucking complain about anything. He's lucky that he's fucking there. You know, he's lucky that he's in the position that he's in right now and that WWE's treating him very well. All in all, AJ Styles, working too stiff, cry me a fucking river. This is professional wrestling, man. This is not fucking ballet. Get over it. You're in the ring, you're going to be taking bumps. You're in the ring, you're going to be fucking getting a beating. You're going to be hurt. You're going to be fucking sore the next day. AJ Styles is nothing but a fucking consummate professional at his craft. Let him do what he's got to do. He's obviously fighting for world titles, so WWE firmly believes in what AJ Styles is doing. Not only with merchandise sales, but what he's doing in the ring and what he's been doing has been fucking great so far. Speaking of AJ Styles, what does WWE think about AJ Styles? Do uh, the WWE officials, Vince McMahon, Kevin Dunn, and higher-ups believe in AJ Styles? He's taken the WWE by storm since debuting at January's Royal Rumble. Styles himself questioned whether or not WWE would even know who he was when he entered the Rumble that night as the third entrant. But the reaction he received proved he was a star and his unquestioned ability in the ring meant he was here to stay and destined to become a fan favorite. But did it necessarily mean a main event push for the, for the Phenomenal One? AJ Styles made his name wrestling for other promotions like Ring of Honor, New Japan, and obviously TNA. It's been well known for years that Vince McMahon and top WWE officials prefer creating homegrown stars molded from their own designs. Vince and those other same officials have had a change of heart recently and are capitalizing on the star power that is AJ Styles. According to a recent report from DWN, Daily Wrestling News, Styles is receiving massive support from those top officials and has left a positive impression on Vince McMahon in two and a half months that he's been with WWE. AJ has already made a dent in merchandising as fans continually buy his wristbands, sweatshirts, t-shirts, and gloves. But perhaps more importantly, or at least in conjunction with the merchandise, WWE management views AJ Styles as their most marketable new talent. It certainly didn't hurt Styles that he had already established a reputation wrestling around the world, but despite some minor promo deficiencies, he seems to have a leg up on some of the newest members of the main roster. Styles quickly established himself as a dynamic performer who could help carry a match or a feud on his abilities in the ring alone. His lone feud thus far saw him square off with Chris Jericho from night after his debut, all the way up until WrestleMania. The two put on clinics on Monday Night Raw and SmackDown, and then again on pay-per-view at Fastlane and WrestleMania. And never did their program feel stale or recycled. I, I, I disagree with that. It, deal, it did feel a little bit too much. I, I'm not going to say it felt stale. I'm not going to say it felt recycled, but it was one too much. Okay, The WrestleMania match did not really need to happen. Jericho turning heel played a big part in that, but AJ consistently entertained with his top-notch performances inside the ropes. Three months ago, he was the hottest free agent on the wrestling market. Now AJ Styles finds himself as the number one contender for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship and in the main event at Payback against Roman Reigns. The decision to put him in that spot was made just recently, but it also may be a part of the driving force behind turning Roman Reigns heel. AJ Styles might be a catalyst for Roman Reigns turning heel. Either way, it appears Styles has cemented himself for now in the WWE's upper echelon main event scene. Gotta be happy for him, man. We all wanted it. We didn't believe it, but it's happening. AJ Styles is going to be in the main event. He's going to be a very, very big part of WWE 2016. He's going to be a vital part of the main event scene, and he's getting over based on his wrestling talent. You know, a lot of that has to do with where he came from and people know who he is. He, he, was, he was a big enough name to the point where he came into the WWE and people knew who he was, but they didn't know how good he was. And now people know how good he is and everything is fucking clicking on all cylinders for AJ Styles. And this is why he has the support of Vince McMahon, WWE officials, and now he's in a main event with Roman Reigns for the WWE Championship. He is the first man WWE has chosen out of WrestleMania, coming out of WrestleMania, to put against Roman Reigns. It's going to be very interesting because there's a lot of different opportunities WWE can take here to make Roman Reigns heal, to create invest in, you know, in engaging, intriguing storylines that we can invest in. It's going to be very interesting, man, and I like the pick of AJ Styles here. Out of everybody, it makes the most sense, and there's the most opportunity for AJ Styles here. It presents the most opportunity, not only for WWE, but for us as fans, as far as storyline goes, man. AJ Styles got the support of Vince McMahon, and he certainly deserves all that recognition. 
And finally, guys, the debut of Doc Gallows and Carl Anderson. What is next for the former Bullet Club members? WWE Raw after WrestleMania 32 saw many new names make their debut to the main roster. It is usually a time for debuts each year, so we all expected to see a ton of new guys. There were two men who did not appear, however, and many fans expected them to do so. They were backstage for WWE SmackDown and were not used. Obviously, those two men are Doc Gallows and Carl Anderson. According to PW Insider, the two men are scheduled for all upcoming WWE shows from here on out. That said, there is a good shot that they are inserted into the tournament in some way. If they are not, it will be interesting to see what WWE does with Anderson and Gallows. It was thought beforehand that the two would not make their debut until Finn Balor's official call-up. Balor remains with NXT, and it's uncertain when he will be called up. WWE will, will of course, be pairing him up with Gallows and Anderson. Doc Gallows has been with WWE in the past. But his transformation over the last few years has put him in a different class over what he was doing with the WWE, and he looks in the best shape of his life. Meanwhile, Carl Anderson has never worked for WWE, but has been sought after for some time. The, the two clearly stand out on their own, but together they make the most formidable combination. This is why WWE wanted to bring them in as a group or a tag team. Some think that WWE will put them with AJ Styles, but it would not make a lot of sense now, especially AJ being a babyface, and using them to help him would turn him heel. In a time where it appears they want to slowly turn Roman Reigns, the heel turn for AJ Styles would not make a ton of sense storyline-wise. That means if they pair up with anyone, it will be NXT champion Finn Balor. The problem is that Balor remains in NXT, while Doc and Carl are on the main roster. We very well could see Balor down the line. It was rumored that he could come up very soon, but Triple H wanted to keep Balor down on NXT for a little while longer. That said, Balor may be held back until the next NXT TakeOver special. Either way, either that or he could appear at or after WWE Payback. As of now, there are various possibilities for him, it seems. As for Doc Gallows and Carl Anderson, we can expect WWE to treat them very well as a tag team until there is a plan for them to pair up with a demon or a phenomenal talent. Now, obviously, we discussed this already. Having them team with AJ right now really doesn't make the most sense. If AJ is a face and he's selling all this types of merchandise, I think WWE would probably, uh, it would probably be in their best interest to keep AJ Styles as a baby face. The other idea which was brought to everybody's attention, uh, you know, people saying that it was from various sources. I heard it from Solid Monster, and I'm going with this. I'm going with this. Roman Reigns leading a new Bullet Club faction, Bulletproof, whatever the fuck you want to call it. Roman Reigns, Doc Gallows, and Carl Anderson together, and AJ Styles. Obviously, they can play off what happened in New Japan. They're here stalking their former leader. They're in the WWE. Now they're with Roman Reigns. AJ Styles, the only way that he, know how, that he knows how to get back at Roman Reigns and get another shot at the WWE Championship after getting screwed by his former fucking colleagues, go out and get Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins and form The Shield or Shield 2.0. Led by AJ Styles, Roman Reigns with the Bullet Club. Have them go at it. Make this a storyline for the rest of the summer. It makes sense. I know a lot of you guys don't see... Roman Reigns leading a Bullet Club, but if you want him to be heel, what other opportunity, what other scenario would work better than having him with Carl Anderson and Doc Gallows screwing over, or screwing over AJ Styles? I don't know. I don't know. I initially wanted AJ to be a heel, and you guys know this. Way back when, it's like four months ago, five months ago, I said, listen, if AJ Styles is coming to the WWE, make him a heel. Bring him in as a heel. Do not debut him in the Royal Rumble. Bring him in with Anderson and Gallows on the Raw after WrestleMania. Have them go after Roman Reigns, NWO style. Have Roman Reigns and AJ Styles battle it out for the WWE Championship because we all knew Roman Reigns was going to come out of WrestleMania as the champion. AJ challenges for the title, coming over from New Japan. Roman Reigns can't do it on his own. He enlists the help of Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose. We have a Shield versus Bulletproof, Bullet Club faction. All the way through the summer. Now, if WWE wants to, you know, flip, flip, flop the Shield and Bullet Club with AJ leading the Shield and Roman leading the Bullet Club, that's the only way you're going to get him heel. 
You're not going to make AJ heel. It's not going to make sense. Roman right now is treading on the path of becoming a heel. It makes sense. There's no other way around it. It's going to be interesting to see. And WWE has several different options here for them to make things special. Do I trust them? Of course not. Do I think they will do good by us? Of course not. But it's there for them. And they have something in front of their faces, on their plate, to make memorable for us and the company and throughout the summer. Hopefully they do right. But Doc Gallows and Carl Anderson obviously are going to have a very, very big part in WWE this summer. And it's going to be big. That's off the script, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I don't know how long I went in this video, but regardless of that, this is the number one fucking podcast. That's why I say I give it to you guys like I know how, like you deserve. Off the script. Thank you guys so much for watching part three for this weekend. I'll be back, as always, on Monday with Monday Night Raw Review. I know Raw is not live on Monday. They are hailing from the United Kingdom, so I'm not going to read spoilers. I'm probably not going to be on Twitter most of the night um, until Monday Night Raw goes live here in the East Coast because I don't want to know any spoilers. I want to be surprised by what happens on the show. So that's that, guys. I'll be back for Monday Night Raw Review. If you did enjoy the video, please hit that thumbs up. Check out the description and check out those videos that I mentioned in the beginning of this video. Uh, and if you missed off the script, parts one and two over Friday and Saturday, they will be linked down in the, in the description as well. Like I said, I'll be back on Monday Night Raw Review. Until then, I am JD. This is Off the Script, the number one fucking source for WWE news and rumors right here on YouTube.com. And I will see you guys for Monday Night Raw Review. Talk to you later.